going to move on to the next piece of Norman's here, and it's a wonderful piece, and it's the one you would see when you first walk in the Art Center. So, Norman, what is the inspiration? Where did this come from? What's, the, what's its journey? I think that, in part, it stems from a trip I made to Texas uh, at a conference, but again, I can't make specific reference to any particular thing other than maybe the landscape, because I, during that trip, when we were, we had some time off, we did have an opportunity to go out into the expansive area. But again, anyone that's from Texas probably would look at it and say, this doesn't look like Texas. <laughs> but the important thing here is that the, 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 it's a lithograph. It's a hand printed lithograph where the elements, the, the individual printing elements, which we refer to as the matrix, I think I've used that term before, uh, are ball grained aluminum plates that are around 12 thousandths of an inch thick. Mm. Okay. Uh, this was printed in, in collaboration with uh, a former student of mine who once he graduated and got his master's degree from Florida State University traveled to Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where the Tamarin Institute is located, and uh, he studied to become a master printer. Now, Tamarin had its beginning in California, and it was uh, started by a wonderful, wonderful person by the name of June Wayne. But it ended up in Albuquerque, and that's where it is today. But Wayne, Wayne Klein is the name of the, the master printer here. And he, f up until the day he died, he was the proprietor and sole printer at Rolling Stone Press Atlanta, which was down near Georgia Tech on Hearst and Calhoun Street. When I uh, did this print, uh, I believe this is one that I actually paid to have him do. In other words, we contracted. And when you sit down with a master printer, you decide how big it's going to be, what it, you know, how many colors are going to be involved, uh, et cetera. And then you agree on it. And uh, there, based on its size and all that, there's, there's a certain amount of money involved in the contract. Oh, yeah. But when I got to his studio the day I was going to create this, I hadn't done any preliminary drawings at all, none. And I walked in and he took, put me off into this side room that he had created after he'd been there a while. He created this place where he could put the artists in a room to be by themselves to work. And he gave me four plates and he said, okay, get started. Hmm. So I went in there and without any preliminary drawings, uh, in my back pocket or in a portfolio, I just started working on this one and uh, he pulled the first proof in black and white. Then uh, from there I went on to do some uh, mylar tracings. Usually you do a mylar tracing using a ballpoint pen. Right. So this was, you went into a printer's office without anything for him to print. He, you went off and created this while you were there? Yeah, it's a fine arts studio. Okay. It's, it's where uh, lithog he, print, he specialized in printing stone lithographs and metal plate lithographs or a combination of both. Right. And uh, his training qualified him to etch the plates carefully and to render them as, as best in the best quality possible to get the best results so they could right. print a lot of additions. Now, my experience at Container Corporation years back in uh, seeing printing and making field trips to photo engraving houses when I was in school, I learned a lot about color separation. And uh, he used to marvel at, he told the students that he taught, he said, Notice how Norman can take the, the yellow, the magenta, the cyan, and the black and put them all together and get full color. And that was based on my studying analytically, just watching printing and watching mm -hmm. how they prepared artwork for printing. And I just translated that 
into this method of working. But there's another lithograph in this show where I had a preliminary watercolor before I started. It was one that he printed, but I had right. a watercolor when I walked in. But this, in this case, I didn't have anything. So did you draw hand. this at this scale, or, or was it in pieces? Like, no, I did, did you... it on this scale. So you With, drew it on this scale? Using lithogra what are called lithographic pencils, which have a specific component of wax, copal, and pigment. Right. And they range from number five to zero, five being the hardest, the least amount of copal, zero being the softest, the most right. amount of copal, which is a, a greasy content. So when, when you were looking at the blank, you know, did you, do you start in this one? I know all your work is different, but did you start at the bottom? Did you come up with the creatures? Because there's <laughs> lots of animals in here. That's a good question. Here. I don't remember where I started. Yeah. Uh, I, I just started making marks. Yeah. And, uh, and then I would elevate these images out of, out of that. And uh, it's kind of chance taking too. Yeah. You, you, it's, a, it's a little bit risky because uh, you can really screw up and you know, it's, it's okay to screw up. Yeah. Well, that's a good, yes, that is true. That's what life's about is making mistakes and learning from them. Uh, so, I mean, there, like I said, there's lots of animals in here. There's like bird things. Serpents. There's kind of a wolf with a really long tail. Yeah, and, and they're, uh, in some cases, like this ghost-like creature is just flying out of, right. uh, off the edge. He, he's that, going somewhere. That bird is kind of dive bombing. Uh -huh. it, it's kind of like a, uh, I, the title I gave it, and I, I wasn't so hesitant in titling this one, Frenzy Encroachment Upon the Earth. Wow. So I, I think I was having some inclinations or <laughs> intuitive feelings about what was happening to the earth. Right. Now, when, okay, that I certainly get. But I, I do notice that uh, in the other works, there's lots of eyes looking at me. And in this one, they're all just kind of doing their own thing. They're not looking out at the, uh, the, the viewer, except for this one down here. Yeah, She's kind sort of giving me the evil eye, That one sort of grows sure. out of the old Kilroy drawing. You remember that one? My, my older brother, who was a mechanical engineer, used to have a, a, a little way of drawing Kilroy. Yeah, I remember Looking that. over the fence. And I think oh, yeah. may, maybe a little bit of that was in my self-conscious when that came out. Yeah, but I can see the Texas connection. And, and uh, just that something feels like it's kind of a, uh, an alive but barren landscape kind of thing. Yeah, the barrenness is, is somewhat of what I saw in Texas, but I think that's, right. again, someone from Texas would not necessarily Depends agree with that. Depends on what part that. of Texas you're from. D yeah, and, and you, you know, I've seen, those miles of nothing, I, saw, it's like I that. saw one video of a, a lady who was in her 90s when these guys were going on a rattlesnake hunt. Yeah. And the only person they, that they knew of who knew anything about where to find rattlesnakes was this 90-year-old woman. Huh. And they watched her, and they went up into the boonies where all these <laughs> rattlesnakes were. And sure enough, she pointed them in the right direction. Wow. I guess that's a, I guess that's a good skill to have. You know? <laughs> well, if you've <laughs> lived can, there your whole life, right. it's, it's part of your life, right? If you know where the rattlesnakes are, then you know where not to go. You know yeah. where they're not. So yeah, that is well, useful. Yeah, my sister tells me that. She, she tells me, she lives in Colorado, and she says there's a section that you go up as you're traveling towards Boulder, I think it is. Yep. You, you just don't walk there at certain times of the year, even if, even if you've been trained. To, to know that they're there because it's a snake infested area. Wow. Well, that's good to know. Hopefully she spreads the word. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I could just look at this one all day. I mean, every time I look through it, it's like, oh, I didn't see that, I didn't see that. Yeah, so what is it about it that, that gets to you? Uh, to me, it feels like uh, if I didn't know you and I just, somebody said, hey, where did that come from? It would feel like it's out of a dream or something. Yeah. It just feels, it has that feeling of movement and tension and uh, beautiful colors. And to know that it's only four colors that created all of this is pretty That's amazing. That's correct, four so colors. So the ghost had to be, it, it, it kind of fits, but then at the same time, it's, it's like, 
it makes it so different and so striking. Was the ghost toward the beginning? Did you say, I want to have a ghost, or it just kind of happened? I don't know. I sometimes think of it as me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. In what way? Uh, maybe kind of uh, traversing out of the chaos. Do you find that your art takes you away from the chaos, or the chaos helps create your art, but then you I think can step aside from it? the chaos in my it? mind helps me create the art, yeah, because yeah. I, have, I, I, I have a chaotic mind, because right. uh, I open my mind to, uh, like, not, not, like not a lot of people, I'm not uh, shocked by some of the really harsh things that you can see. I don't shy away from that. Right. I mean, people encounter this every day. As you well know, all of the medical people that are in the front lines are encountering more and, encountering more, and more and more of this type of thing every day. Right. And uh, every once in a while, even, even the reporters uh, that reported, uh, especially out in California, they're breaking down. Right. Because they're trying to be very objective in covering all of the bad stuff that's going on and it just gets to the point that it's boiling in their system. Right. True. We try to keep chaos out of our lives by at least finding some structure that can yeah. guide us a little bit. But for the artist, you have to let chaos into your life, yeah. don't you? Well, I, I like, uh, even though, again, I'm not a musicologist and I don't know that much about it, but there, there are a couple of pieces of music, classical music that I really like, and it's not just classical music that does this. Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring is one of those, mm -hmm. and the Concerto for Orchestra, which was commissioned by Serge Kusevitsky from the Boston Pops Orchestra back when um, Bela Bartok was suffering from leukemia. He was, he was dying from leukemia when he mm. wrote that piece of music. Wow. And, when you first listen to it, if you've never listened to it before, it's harsh. Yeah. It, it's hard to take unless you're open to it. And then if you listen, the more and more you listen to it, as I do, I listen to it often. I really love it. I, it's just fantastic music, as is the Rite of Spring. Right. Do you find that the music you listen to puts you in a state of mind that, that pushes your art in a certain direction? Sometimes, sometimes I don't want to listen to it. Right. Sometimes I want to just be quiet. Mm -hmm. Well, this and I have this to listen piece to the is... darn furnace <laughs> turn on. Yeah, no kidding. There's never much. There's never really any total silence in the world yes. today. Hardly ever. Well, this piece here is not silent for sure. Yeah. It speaks. Well, it's interesting too. A, a lady when I exhibited this back in 2017, a complete stranger walked up to me and told me that she thought it was a masterpiece, and I nearly dropped over because I don't ever think of anything that I do that could come close to being on that level. And I'm sorry to this day that I didn't drag her off to the side and sit her down and say, could you please tell me why you think this is a masterpiece? Well, I think she was right. So, and it, it, I mean, it's one of those things, it's like, it's just so striking that it's hard to put, you could, it's hard to put your finger on it. You could have sat down with her for 30 minutes and she probably couldn't have explained why she thought that. But she just knew it in her heart that, that that's what it was. And that's the kind of person I want to continue to look at art. And, and maybe she's already accustomed to it. She, could, right. she probably goes to museums often and subjects herself, if that's the proper word, right. to the, the giving her own input in and then sucking something out of it. But I think more and more people who are reticent or reluctant to do that should, should make it part of their regular daily life and mm -hmm. kind of step aside a little bit from the, the rigors of daily life. It's difficult now because so many people are having so, right. so many struggles. As we sit here with a mask on. Yeah, but I think you just have to do it. Right. I, I do. I, I'm accustomed to it. I'm, it's just part of me. It's ingrained in my system. Yeah. I walk around with a camera all the time. I've got... There's more artwork in my computer that you'll never see. I mean, I, I work in Photoshop a lot. Right. Well, that's true. I mean, now that with everybody having a camera in their phone for the most part, then uh, 
Yeah, I could, they need to see the world and yeah, that's a way interesting other than that what you're they... talking about that because, for example, I've had a couple of professors who have gone on to become very well known. Here, uh, Aaron Siskind is one yeah. who is involved in abstract expressionism, and Harry Callahan, who spent a good deal of his life photographing his wife. They were they were together for years until he died. But she was a subject matter of his for many, many years, and mm. he was very well known for all of his work in multiple exposure. And I was influenced by those people. Again, a young, naive kid out of, co out of high school and junior college, I didn't know him very much. I don't know a lot now. I just don't. I'm well, I used to tell my students that one of the best things you could ever learn is that you don't know very much. And then it kind of makes you open to, to learning all kind of things. Yeah. And so, you know, but uh, on that note, are there, do you, when you're working on this or any of your other pieces, uh, do you see other people's influence on you? Not necessarily technique, but emotionally, whether it was well, your wife or who or whatever. The surrealists like Max Ernst. Yep. Um, I've got some of his quotes over there on the wall. As I said earlier, John John Dubuffet. Yep. Uh, in his uh, brute art, the rawness of art. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. Right. And, uh, I don't. You know, I'm not a realist, as you can tell, but I've had colleagues who were, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of came of age as a college teacher with a friend who studied under a man by the name of Roger Anlicker at the Carnegie Mellon Institute in Pittsburgh, and he was a realist, and he thought, I don't know how he came to this conclusion, just like that lady. He said, I think you're one of the more creative people I know. And, I'm, mm. and, and his work was, uh, he, he could take a bee's nest or a piece of farm equipment and, and uh, render it just so beautiful. Uh, wow. He loved, uh, who was the artist uh, uh, from Pennsylvania that did such beautiful work? I, I, I'm at a um, loss for words right now. Yeah, I know. The one of the girls in the field looking yeah, up the hill. Yeah, yeah. He, he always touted him a lot. He right. loved him. And rightfully so, because that work is really yeah. beautiful. Oh, it is. You can just, it tells a story. The art that tells a story is good, is good. Because you can come back to it again and again, and, and it tells a different story. Another, another artist I like, too, but it's, it's hard to even think about emulating, because it goes so far back historically, is Hieronymus Bosch and Peter Bruegel. Yeah. I mean, those artists just were phenomenal. Right. They are phenomenal. Yes. And they have great names. Hieronymus. Yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, anyway. Does so that this answer is, your question? Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, in, in so many ways. So to me, this is uh, wonderful. If you come into the Art Center, uh, you need to come up here so you can see this piece because it is absolutely amazing.